we find is a concept which the prophet speaks about and rebukes and reprimands the Jewish people continuously. It's referred to as, in the Hebrew context, mitzvah anoshim lumodo. It's the behavior of the human being, which is only purely through rote. Rote conditioning, where we could almost inevitably do something almost perfectly in action, but in terms of infusing it with intent, very often the intent is not, not only not sufficient, the intent is totally lacking. I'll give you an example. There's a discussion in the Talmud for mitzvah to have value, do you have to do the mitzvah for the sake of the mitzvah, which is for the sake of God? Or even if one doesn't consciously think he's, he's doing it for the sake of God, he still fulfills his obligation of executing the mitzvah. It's an argument. Does the mitzvah have to be infused with that intent? I mean, before you do the mitzvah, I have a mind, I'm doing it for God's sake, or even if you don't think it. For instance, when you put on tefillin, you know you're putting on tefillin. It's not you're in a trance and you realize what you're doing, except you don't think and have in mind, I'm doing it for the sake of God. So there's an argument. Does it have any value or does it not have any value? One opinion is it has no value whatsoever. Unless it's infused with the intent you're doing for the sake of God, it has no value. That and the way it's expressed, mitzvah tzrichas kavona. A mitzvah requires intent. Without intent, it's just an act which is disconnected. There's a disconnect. The other one says, no, as long as you're aware that you're doing the mitzvah, although you don't have a mind specifically for the sake of God, it has value. Because why else are you doing it? If not for God's commandment. Even having such a superficial level of connection, it has a minimal level of value. Everybody agrees, of course, the more it's infused, the more one invests in the execution of a mitzvah, the greater value it has, but even at the most minimal level, which is being aware, that's sufficient. The way we rule, the Talmud leaves it unresolved. So we have a principle, when, every, when one is in doubt whether he, whether he fulfilled his rabbinical obligation or not, the rabbis legislated their laws that if there's ever a question whether you fulfilled your obligation or not, one is absolved. One doesn't have to act stringently and repeat it. That's why the person before one eats, one is supposed to predicate his eating and drinking with acknowledging God, whatever the text of the bracha may be. And one doesn't recall whether he said the bracha or not. We say, in doubt, one does not say a bracha. One does not say a bracha. Why? Because since the obligation to say a blessing prior to eating or drinking is rabbinical, when one is in doubt, we say, sovik drabon lakula. One is in doubt regarding rabbinic enactment, you deal with it leniently. But if it would be a question on a Torah level, a biblical obligation, for instance, Torah says that if one eats bread, a bread meal, and you eat to a sated point, one has a Torah obligation to acknowledge God, thank God for that satiation. One eats to that point, and one does not recall whether he made that acknowledgement, known as Bircha Samozot, blessing after meal. Since the obligation of that acknowledgement is a Torah obligation, we say, you're in doubt, you must repeat it. Because of the level of 
seriousness and value of a Torah obligation, one is in doubt, one must repeat it. So therefore, since this is an unresolved question, whether a mitzvah without the infusion of intent has value, if it's only rabbinic mitzvah, one does not have to repeat the mitzvah. But if it's a Torah mitzvah, one must repeat it. One must repeat it because of the graveness and the seriousness of a Torah, a biblical obligation. So, give you an example. One eats matzah to Seder. Eating matzah to Seder is a Torah obligation. Every adult man, woman must eat matzah to Seder. You fulfill a positive commandment. And one ate the matzah arbitrarily without thinking that they're doing for the sake of the mitzvah of eating matzah on the 15th of, of Nisan. One must re-eat that matzah. Was the, since it's a Torah obligation, if one does not infuse it with that intent, it has no value. However, outside of Israel, we have two sedorim. The second day we have the Seder, it's rabbinical. The second night, if you had that same question, you did not infuse it with the proper intent. You do it to take a mitzvah, one doesn't have to repeat the eating of the matzah. Of course, the second Seder is only rabbinical, and therefore, it doesn't have to be re-eaten. The drinking of the cups at the Seder, the four cups, to commemorate the four expressions of redemption are rabbinical. It's to commemorate the four expressions of redemption. One just drinks them arbitrarily. You know, drinks them, sings his dayenu, and they're ready to go. Like people say, when are we getting to dayenu already? You know, how long is this Seder going to drag out? And they used to have, you know, Manashevitz. Manashevitz had a square bottle of wine, Malaga wine. And whatever. Now, when are we getting there? The big goblets of wine. Rabbinical. One did not infuse it. One does not re-drink the wine. It's rabbinical. Even without having that special intent, one fulfills its obligation. But everybody agrees. If you do infuse it, with, a mitz, with the, that intent, it takes on, no question, a greater level of value. For instance, there's a mitzvah, positive commandment to love God. There's a positive commandment to revere God. If a person serves God with love and reverence, it's a different level of service. You're behaving like a true subject to a master. I am dedicated. The intent is an expression of dedication. If it's lacking in the reverence, in the love, or the attention, I didn't pay attention to it. What does it say? What is the nature of the relationship? To what degree do you value the relationship between the subject and the master? Evidently, not to a great degree, because how could you not be focused? If you stand and you understand you're in the presence of God, how do you not have a sense of who you're speaking to and what you're saying. So therefore, not having the intent, the question, it's a very minimized level of service. So regardless of what we rule, the greater level of intent, focus, infusion, the greater quality service it is, without a question. You know, in life, human being, why are we so unappreciative on many levels? It's an expression because we take things for granted. You know, the certain corporations or the government, they give grants. What does grant mean? That if you make a request that you work on a certain project, they give you a grant to assist you. But one has no obligation to pay back the grant. It's taken for granted. It's like a grant. 
You're not beholding. There's no obligation whatsoever. People take many things in life for granted. Our health, our success. If you're qualified, if you're intelligent, if you know the right people, and you appreciate your product, and you could evaluate your customer, and you know exactly how to communicate, it's, as they used to say, it's a shoe in almost guaranteed. He's a super salesman. He's never lost an account, okay? That means taking for granted. He's never lost money. He's a rainmaker until it stops raining. You're only as good as you are, as good as you are. The moment there's the downturn, as they say, it's history. People forget what the past was. It's what we deal with the present. But a person who truly has the appropriate understanding of life and focus, we take nothing for granted. Every moment is an endowment of God. God endows every moment of our life, our health, physical, mental, emotional, our surroundings, safety, every aspect of our function is a continuous endowment. And if you believe that, but it's not only believe, you're cognizant of that. Of course, you ask any person who believes as he should believe, you say, of course, that's, that's the reality. But is there a cognizant of, cognizance of that? Do you have the sense that continuously? I'll give you an example. There's a sign up. Anybody comes between nine and five to a certain location, he receive a thousand dollars. Person waits four hours online, and he gets the thousand dollars. When he gets that thousand dollars in his hand, does he know he's getting a thousand dollars? Of course, he knows he's getting it. He waited four hours to get that that thousand dollars. Is he taking it for granted? To a degree, maybe. Because if all he has to do is wait online to get that thousand dollars, he's not appreciative. Because all you have to do to be eligible, you have to wait online. So the person is not appreciative that he's to the one who gives it to him. I expect it because I met the criteria. I waited online. But that, that's not the reality. That is not the reality of in terms of having a relation with God. You receive it. Every moment of life is a challenge. How do I process the moment? At this moment, that that I'm able to breathe, that I'm able to think, that I'm able to articulate words clearly, co coherently, why am I able to do it? It's like sometimes a person recovers from an illness and he has difficulty putting his thoughts together and expressing it. The words don't come out right. And the person may even have to go into rehab to repattern the mind, to be able to think and focus. Not so simple. You now it's interesting. We don't know it, thank God. A person who suffers a stroke Although through re rehab, through real rehabilitation, he's able to get certain functions back in place. His gait is back, his movements are back, his face is no longer contorted, all that. But if you speak to the stroke victim, he says his mind is not the same. The thoughts don't come as easily. There's a certain level of disconnect or effort or he's not able to overcome certain difficulties. And he only he knows it, nobody else knows it. He senses the difference. But before he suffered the stroke with the best re rehabilitation, it's not the same. So now maybe he appreciates what he had at one time which he no longer has. People get older, 
They suffer from arthritis. And after a while, you live with it. Do you stop to think for a moment? When you were younger, you didn't have the pains due to the arthritic condition. Do you think that how appreciative I should have been, which I was not? Because even when the person has the arthritic condition, he accepts it. But you realize even now, when you have the condition, it could be worse. Could be worse. You say, thank God it's not worse. Or thank God I, there's medication that I could take to lessen the pain, that I could be functional. But unfortunately, people don't think that way. They don't. Because everything in life is conditioning, even to be focused, you have to be trained to be focused. It's a training. It's a, as people do things through conditioning and therefore it's rote behavior, identically to be able to be focused, you have to be trained to be focused. If you're trained to be focused, you notice things. Otherwise you gloss over most things. Sometimes you, visually you don't even see it. That's to what degree a person glosses over, it's unnoticed. But even if we notice things, visually speaking, we're not touched by them. And if you're not touched by that, it doesn't affect your life as much as an iota. But life, being endowed by God every moment is opportunity. Every moment is challenge. How do I utilize this moment? Do I take advantage to invest it as it's meant to be invested, or just let it slide, as they say, and just leave it? Chavetz Chai makes a point that a person, even if he has a share in the world to come, which is ultimately the objective of this life, as it says in Pirkei Ovos, this world is only a corridor. It's a pass-through to the world to come. And let's say you succeeded and you make it through the door. You make it from the, through the corridor into the banquet hall. But whatever level you enter, that level that you're at is forever. A person goes to diplomatic school or to office training school and he maxes out as second lieutenant. But if he would have applied himself, he could have achieved three-star general based on his capability. He's a second lieutenant forever. Never ever to rise above that level. And when he realizes, if he would have applied himself to a slightly greater degree, he could have been the three-star general. And he would have had other levels of privilege, different levels of relationship with the upper echelons. But as they say, it's too late. Life, when one leaves this existence, you're at the level that you leave. All the times that you could have invested the time differently, more appropriately. If you did not, when you leave, you're at that level. You never advance above that level. This is forever, for all eternity. And if you think about this, it was known, Rav Sajigon, who was from the Gonic period, every day that he lived, he would repent. What was the basis for the, his repentance? Because every day that passed, the next day he realized where he could have been the, the previous day. So he repented why the previous day he was not at the next, at the more advanced level. Because every day came to another realization of where he could have been. So he had remorse, why wasn't I there? And he continuously inched his way up.
I studied two hours a day, three hours a day. But there were another 15 hours a day available, which I could study. It's not that I don't value its value. But I think I've done enough. I invested sufficiently. You know, like some people say, I'm a small time investor. Not a lo- lo- I'm not a long term or large investor, small time. Okay. But as they used to say, the way you make your bed, that's the way you sleep. That's the way it is. That's the reality of life. The Talmud says, the person who prepares Arab Shabbos, he will eat on Shabbos. Meaning in this world, if you do proper preparation, invest your life properly, on Shabbos, meaning when you come to a point which is the world to come, you will be a beneficiary of all your investment. Every aspect of that investment. It's everything itself is based upon what? Reflection. If you don't stop to reflect and think of opportunity and value, it just slips through our fingers. And as we all know, as we get older, time goes, passes very quickly. Before you turn around, the week is over. Before you turn around, the season is over. Before you turn around, the year is over. And the years just run by. And what did you accomplish? We take stock. What have I accomplished this past year? Where am I this year where I was next this previous year? What is my level of advancement? And it's a question we have to ask ourselves every day. Am I today different than I was the day before? Well, I'll wait to Rosh Hashanah. You know, that's when you do an introspection for Yom Kippur. Read in Pikri Ovos. Don't say when I'll have time, I'll study. Because that moment may never come. Never come. You never know. And being conscious of that, that opportunity may present itself once, may not present itself again. Therefore, you take advantage of the moment. And if you live your life, see, when it comes to material, that's called greed. You have enough. You don't need more. to share with you something. My father, Lava Shalom, was a regular down-to-earth person. Grew up in the 20s, didn't have much. And Baruch Hashem, later in life, he succeeded financially. So one of my brothers, who was in business with him at one time, said to my father, Dad, I'm buying myself a set of sterling silver cutlery. Would you want a set? My father says, not interested. He says, but it's, it's beautiful. Sterling silver, this. My father says, when I eat the food, whether it's a stainless steel fork or a silver fork, it's the same food. It doesn't make a difference. I don't need it. I'm not interested. And that's where it began. That's where it ended the conversation. As they used to say in English, lean, lean and mean. That's it. Keep life uncomplicated. You get too cluttered up with all the minutia of life, with all these side issues, you lose focus. People are always assuming new projects. What are the projects? Projects of what? You know, I'm collecting years ago, people used to collect stamps and coins. In the 50s, 60s, everybody used to collect um, coins. He had albums, plate blocks, just go to the post office, used to buy a, a sheet of stamps, and there was a plate block, four stamps, and you had a serial number on the edge of that, those four stamps. You know, especially when the, they first came out, it was a big thing. Because someday it may be worth money or whatever it may be. Everybody was collecting, nothing wrong with it. Occupies yourself, it gives you a sense of responsibility as a young person. But people, all their lives, they're collecting. They collect this, collect that. They collect bills, mass bills, mass debt. Mortgages, car payments. 
doctor bills, because, you know, they were actually going at a thousand RPMs a second, because life is too precious to pass up on, except unfortunately, the barking up the wrong tree. You're not putting your eggs in the right basket. So everything is focus, but we don't. We act with, we act almost impulsively without thinking. It's called road Judaism. And the prophet continuously screams at this and he admonishes the Jewish people. You serve me with your lips. These are the prophet's words, but your heart is far from me. Your hearts are far from me. The heart and the mouth are disconnected. You say things, but the mind, is, which is the heart, the, is not there. And it's a problem. It's definitely not re reverence. It's, in the, it's not reverence, and it's not love. Because something that you revere, and you love, and you value, you pay attention, and you don't lose focus. So what's most important, which is you, the purpose of your existence, I would talk to mean people who know it. We believe it. But yet, when it comes to behavior, how we behave, is a whole different reality. I mentioned, there's a verse in Mishle, in Proverbs. King Solomon says, Nitzraf Lakesif, I may have mentioned a few weeks ago, how do you test the purity of silver? You put it through a crucible. How do you test the purity of iron? You put it through a smelter. The less dross, the less impurity. You know, it's, it's the metal is, is, is pure. And how do you test the purity of man? Each man according to what he praises. So Rabbeinu Yona, who's one of the early commentators, in his commentary on Proverbs writes, it can be understood of one or two ways. Each man according to what he's praised. So he says, that's not, it's not possible. That's not what King Solomon is saying. Because a lot of people are praised by society, but that's based on societal values. And if the values are not correct, they praise them for things which it's not worthy of praise. Give you an example. Remember when Senator Javits passed away, he came from a Sephardic descent, Javits. He's a Jewish senator. And they said over at his funeral, it was written up, that when he was already an older man, he could dance like nobody could dance. This is at the funeral. Instead, it's not getting him anywhere. Okay, but he's praised. He was the fun, of, he was the life of the party. It's not getting anywhere with that. So Rabbeinu Yonah says, Ishlafi Malolo, you evaluate a person's purity based on what he praises. Listen to a person, what his priorities in life are. If he praises the proper things and he reveres and esteems what's appropriate, regardless of his behavior, that's the essence of what he is. And if his behavior is appropriate, but he praises the wrong things and he reveres the wrong things, his essence is negative although his behavior is appropriate. And he gives the example. You have a person who was raised observant and he does everything right. But whenever you enter a conversation with him, all he talks about is his hedonistic behavior, values, material, and how he's not satisfied with his degree of immersion in material. He wants to advance. So what does that tell you about the person? What is a person consumed with? What's most important to him? So what's the most important to that person? That he puts on film every morning and observe Shabbos? Or it's the material pursuit? 
And you have another person who may not be that observant, but all he speaks about is spiritual endeavors, spiritual values, who God is, what his beliefs was, and he wishes he could be better. And he's focusing on that. So Rabbeinu Yonah writes, the person is not observant and all he speaks about is spirituality and trying to advance in that area. He says, although his behavior is not tzaddik, his essence is tzaddik. And the other person who behavior wise behaves like a tzaddik, but all he does is revere and esteem material, his essence is Russia. He's a hedonist. He's an intellectual animal. He happens to go through motions behaving like an observant Jew. It's the essence. So what one is, that's what we express ourselves. And that is your essence. That's what we hear. Those are the words. Those are the values. It shows itself very clearly when it comes to ego. People claim they're humble. But if you have a sense of what humility is and you hear people and you see the way they behave and the way they put themselves out there, sometimes it's so ugly. The person is so hungry for that acknowledgement and honor. He'll twist himself into a pretzel to get that acknowledgement. I'll give you an example. A person is a bright person and he speaks after he finished speaking, there are 50 people that go at, over there, did you hear what I said? How did you like what I said? There's a three-year-old kid there who, who, who it hasn't reached, and reached a level of intelligent development. By the way, did you hear what I said? Uh, excuse me, the child is only two and a half years old. He, he doesn't even understand the language. What are you asking me here? That's how hungry he is for that acknowledgement. But he's a humble man. He thinks he's humble. What's wrong with asking? I wonder if maybe I made a difference in that in his life. If you made a difference in his life, what are you, what are you asking? What are you asking a three-year-old child? Did he appreciate what you said? Ultimately, once colors shine out, or worse than that, and it tells you who he is, you, you can't you can't you can't keep it under wraps. And that's the way it is. We mentioned the Gemara, Talmud says that the Hasidim and Rishonim, I mentioned this, they would send, spend nine hours a day just focusing and experiencing the Amidah. Three hours, an hour preparation for the Amidah, an hour to pray, and an hour afterwards to reflect on the experience. Three times a day. A person would say, what's taking so long? An hour to reflect on the Abida. So I gave an example recently, speaking to someone, I said, if you'd be going as a personal guest to Buckingham Palace, the Queen of Elizabeth, and it is the custom, if you go, you have to bring a gift to the Queen, just to show you respect. You can do such research on what kind of gift you should buy. You're gonna give it such attention and you're gonna read up on it and you're gonna be advised on it. What is appropriate, what's not appropriate? How much should you spend? How much should you not spend? Should it be made in England or should it be made in China? Right, or maybe in Vietnam. You, change, you could even put on a label made in, made in London. They could do anything in Vietnam and in China, you know? They could even re recreate the queen. <laughs> Okay, they'll, even, they'll, they'll do the cosmetic surgery, no problem. Why, when you go to the queen to offer that gift, why do you leave no stone unturned to make sure that gift is appropriate and reflects proper respect and reverence and, and, and honor? Why? Of course, you know you're going to the queen. If you're gonna to go to the Buckingham Palace and sit at her queen's table, you have to bring and act appropriately, even more than appropriately, which it exudes respect and reverence and everything that goes along with that, because this is royalty. You're in within 
the proximity of royalty. You can't behave differently and you understand it. And yet, when you enter into an audience with God, who's the creator, with him, nothing means nothing. You know how much money you have? You know how much I have? What's the basis for a person's sense of, self, of self-centeredness? His level of accomplishment. But the man's a fool. Everything you have is God gave you. It's God given. And you feel pompous in God's presence. You know what level of arrogance this is? You got it backwards. I'm coming to pray to God to pay my respects because I have an obligation and I feel I'm deserving because who I am and who are you? The Talmud tells over a story. There was a person, he was a gangster, mafia person. And he says to his wife, I think it's time for me to repent. Repent. I've lived a life of crime my whole life. I've stolen. I've plundered. So his wife says to him, don't you realize you're a fool? If you repent, the pants you're wearing, you got to give back to the original owner. You will be stripped naked. You'll have nothing. I don't think it's a good idea you should repent because you'll be left penniless. So he says, you know something? Maybe you got a point there. I'm not repenting. That's the conversation between this mafia person and his wife. He stand before God. Do you know who I am? You know what kind of real estate portfolio you have? You know, you know I pay, there's a golf, there's a, a country club out in Long Island. It's a million dollar membership. How many people could afford that? You think God cares what kind of club you swing? Whether it's a big birther or it's a this club or that club. They think he cares. You're talking to the wrong person. It's like people who name drop. You got a Warren Buffett and you start dropping names. You know, the, 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 the bookie on, on 42nd Street and somebody else on 43rd Street. Are you out of your, you know who you're talking to? But yet we have a sense of self when we stand in God's presence. The Talmud tells us that God cannot tolerate three people. Three people cannot tolerate them. One is a poor person who's arrogant. God has no patience for that person. A rich man, you say at least, he deludes himself because of his wealth. But a poor man who has nothing, what are you being arrogant about? An old man who's a philanderer. You know something, it's time to grow up already. You have two feet in the grave. You're still misbehaving. God says, this person, I have no patience for. And the third person, Talmud says something interesting. If you go and knock on a door, you walk into somebody else's house without knocking first. Just open the door, walk in. God does, will, does not tolerate that kind of person's behavior because it's such a lack of value in another person's existence. How do you have a right to walk into somebody else's home just without knocking, just walking straight in? It's an indication that it's everything is you. The other person has no value whatsoever. And the Talmud says, even walking to your own home, your own home, and the only ones at home is your wife. Before you walk into the house, you should knock to alert her that you're coming. Why? Because she may be involved in doing something very private and you may embarrass her. But not that she's doing anything wrong. It's just respect, basic respect for another person. You know what the answer is? You respect nobody but yourself. The other person's feelings mean nothing. God says that kind of person, I have no time for, I have no patience for, I cannot tolerate. It's that kind of thing. What kind of pompous behavior is this? You're, you have no consideration to anybody but yourself? And could you imagine this kind of person, we have an obligation to acknowledge God three times a day and to an audience. And the person feels he's God's gift to humanity. Of course, you know, he wears a kind of cologne imported from, from Paris, from the, a perf, it's made special perfume, but it's cologne, men's cologne. 
The man is so old, he lost his sense of smell 30 years ago. But he has, wears the, the clothes, everybody should know who he is. You understand? And he stands before God with his silk, silk pocket handkerchief and whatever else he's wearing there. And he thinks he has what to say, what to display. God says, you, you, you're barking up the wrong tree here. Could you imagine a guy showing up at the Norval Ball wearing a wetsuit? They said, you know, we're not scuba diving here. Please show up with a wetsuit. You understand? It's the same thing. A person stands before God and he's arrogant and he's not dressed appropriately. He show, displays no humility. God says, you know, don't waste my time. You don't belong here. To be continued.